So imagine my surprise when I was diagnosed in 2012 with stage 3C ovarian cancer. I was a healer. I've been singing for my health all these years. Why now? What's going on? It was very interesting. And that's when I heard, congratulations, you've graduated. You're ready to move on. Okay, show me how. So learning right away that my first and most important path was to consistently go within to ask questions. It wasn't an education that came from the cancer dance, but it was an answer to what do I do with this cancer dance? And Spirit said, you've graduated. Congratulations. You have everything you've ever needed to get through this, and you will. All right, sweet spirit, show me how. So that was my go-to. How do I do this? Do it differently. Do it differently than anybody's ever done. All right, how? Sweet spirit, show me how. So I was able to use all of the tools, as spirit said, all the way through, but then learning what that actually meant and how it was uh, presented and how it then progressed into um, a directive and an action. So when I heard spirits say, believe it or not, have fun with it, how the heck do you have fun with cancer? You learn. Okay, sweet spirit, show me how. So I learned very quickly how to rely on those questions and how not to expect so much of myself, especially through the first cancer dance when I had been ripped open four times, surgery, surgery, emergency surgery, colostomy, all that stuff, and I was physically unable to do anything. 89 pounds. I really relied on the inner voice consistently. And through that deepening and willingness to consistently go within, I've learned to trust that voice more and more and consequently to trust myself more and more as I get out of my way. When I was first diagnosed, I was in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and I fell into the arms of the minister and his wife and cried for three hours. I knew that I needed to go down that rabbit hole and feel the feelings. That's one of the things my mom taught me early, early on. Don't try to push them down, feel them, but then get on with it. <laughs> Do it as a tool, as a purpose, so I knew. And like my daddy taught me, kind of watch the thinker. I was able to watch myself have this meltdown and thinking, oh, isn't this interesting? You're doing this now, hmm. But then afterwards, I remember to get centered and to ask those important questions. And I knew better than to ask, why me? Because you always hear, why not you? So why now was my first question. And that's when I heard, of course, you've graduated. And then I asked, well, how? How do I do this? Well, three treatments short of my 18-week protocol of the second cancer dance. I stopped taking chemo. I had been in remission already, so with my doctors okay, I quit taking chemo because my mom was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer the day before Thanksgiving. And my sister and I agreed that this was the only time mommy was going to die and that we were going to do it right whatever that looked like. So we alternated spending time with mom for the next five months, talking about dying, talking about her photographs and her books and her loves. It was heart-wrenching, magical, horrible, <sighs> delicious. Delicious was the term that my sister and I came up with when we were grieving when she was first diagnosed. 
we realized immediately how human this feeling was and how on the other side of love this grief was. And if we didn't love mommy so much, we wouldn't be grieving so much. So how could we not grieve? And how could we not call this delicious? So naturally, Kristen and I were singing over mom when she died. One of my favorite, one of my mom's favorite songs of mine. When I'm an old woman preparing for my rest, will I see my family of angels from the past? Smiling faces tell me that I'll not be alone. Winged graces beckoning, they'll come to take me home. And she gave us her last breath right then. It was amazing. A year almost to the day later, a year and six days later, Daddy died. Which is pretty common for couples, but interestingly enough, Mom and Dad had been divorced for 42 years. <laughs> and dad had been remarried, so <laughs> I don't understand that spiritual connection to this day, but they died that close together in April. And in between then, my husband had a major heart attack and wound up in the hospital with a double bypass surgery. Thank God he survived. But I don't think there's a wonder why I went into chemo the third time. Because with all of that delicious grief, I know that that could have, I don't want to blame that, but that could have churned things up again. Whatever. But the cancer came back. And I didn't have mom and dad any longer. I knew I needed help during chemo itself. So how, how can I do this without mom and dad? Well, I asked four and five people at a time. <laughs> it took that many people <laughs> to be with me during Chemo Dreamo. And I asked for a private room, which I was able to luckily get just about every time. And in that private room, we covered the chemo, uh, marked poison again with a bag with those delicious words on it. I had created another hour's worth of music for pre-meds happy little fishies eating all the bad cells away love solutions making my whole body whole songs about chemo about dreaming well i recognized what a, an opportunity it is to be able to talk about death and dying and demystify it like i've been working to do with cancer itself and with chemo and the colostomy and everything else how could i possibly talk about crossing over dying deliciously as my sister and I call it, if I weren't faced with it myself. So what a gift, what an opportunity. How fun is this while I feel good? And I recognize that's the key. It's easy to talk about death and dying, even with a terminal diagnosis, when I feel good. Recently, there was an audition in Indianapolis for a series like a TED Talk called Walk the Talk here in Bloomington. I. Uh, uh, made the grade, six out of 29 people I was selected. The week before the first mandatory rehearsal, I felt like I had been kicked in the solar plexus. And I didn't know if it's the cancer already, if it's from the drugs, what the heck's going on? And it lasted for an entire seven days. I was debilitated. I couldn't move out of the house. I couldn't go to my threshold choir practice. I couldn't be with my friends. And I thought, God, this is not something I actually thought about. The process of dying. <laughs> I mean, crossing over is one thing. And I've come to grips with being on the other side over and over again, especially now that mom and dad are there. I'm much more eager and willing and ready to go. But the process and the pain that might accompany that, I wasn't quite prepared for. So while I was in the pain, I couldn't really uh, discover anything. I couldn't, I was having even a hard time meditating because it was in the same area that my power center was in. I thought, this is so interesting. I had a doctor's appointment with my oncologist who recognized the symptom right away and said it's esophageal 
it's from one of the meds you're on, gave me another medication, which took three days to work, but it did work. And I thought, holy shift, I am not ready for pain. What do I do with this? What is the use of pain? And as I was in meditation, I remembered so clearly the last maybe whole month of mom's life that my sister and I were pleading with God to take her because she was in so much pain. <laughs> and how the, the deep grief when she did pass had a ribbon of deep gratitude and a thread of elation because she was in no more pain. And I went, oh, oh, the pain may not be for me. It may be for my beloveds who are letting me go. It might be easier for them to let me go if I'm in a bunch of pain. I get it now. Okay. Suffering is a luxury. And who am I to deny, even myself, the luxury of suffering? So again and again, I go back and I say, show me how. Show me how to embrace the pain. Show me how to love my body enough to allow it to deteriorate. Show me how to stay in trust that the doctors will know what to do to make me not be in too much pain, but perhaps enough to allow my beloveds to let me go when it's my time. And that's just been within the last week. <laughs> so, so much, so much, so much. And when the doctor said a year to 18 months, because I'm so otherwise healthy, well, holy shift. Does this look like the body of someone who's dying? Does this feel like the energy of someone who's dying? Well, up until the week of pain, I didn't think so. So show me how to dance with it. Show me how to embrace it. Show me how to let go when it's my time. Show me how to die deliciously. Gosh, I've had a seven year education almost. I feel like I took a whole college degree. That I would not be who I am now without it all three dances. I wouldn't be who I am now without losing my mom and dad when I did in between dance number one or dance number two and three. I have learned so much that I would not ever not want to be here after all of this stuff. Now going forward, I'm not necessarily looking forward to going through what I might need to to die, but I wouldn't ever change the last six and a half years because Healing is not a cure, and it never has been, because we're all going to die. How do we die healthy, and what does that even mean? So one of my favorite new songs is, When My Healing Comes in the Form of Dying, because ultimately, that's the biggest healing we can have. We're just going to God. We're going to the other side. So that's the biggest education I've had. But then how to, how to dance with it. None of us is gonna live forever. Each of us is born, then lives, then dies. And even though we're all- For me, especially gratitude is incredibly essential, not just important, it's essential to be able to stay in the present, to be able to embrace the future, to be able to embrace whatever's going on in my body, even if it's nasty and I'm in pain, how to be grateful for that. I'm so grateful for a lifetime full of my sister and I just started last week, in fact, every morning going through a rampage of appreciation. <laughs>
together every single morning. What are you rampaging about this morning, she'd say. My father was a, a Eckhart Tolle devotee. And for years, he would tell me to stay in the now moment. Don't go in the future. Don't worry about the past. Stay in the now moment. And I would say, but Daddy, what happens if the now moment sucks? Isn't there an opportunity to go someplace else to buy locate? Or <laughs> and he'd say, no, there's always something to be grateful for. So he kind of drummed that into my head for a long time. And I practiced that consciously. So when I was first going through surgery, on my way home from my tour in Florida, where I was first diagnosed, I had two weeks to drive home. And had I known how dire my situation was at the time, I didn't look at the numbers. I didn't research what ovarian cancer did. I knew better. I was told not to. I told my mother not to. She memorized the Merck manual, so for her that was huge. On my way home, had I known how dire it was, I might have driven off a bridge. But watching myself, like my father were, reminded me to do, and to stay in the now moment, and to find things to be grateful for, helped me spend the rest of the tour like I needed to, and get home and in surgery. And I never needed gratitude more than I did in chemo. Because the bag marked poison going into my body had to be shifted somehow. And how better to shift it than going from fear to gratitude. Now how can I be grateful to a chemical marked poison that they say would kill you as soon as it's going to cure you? I mean, the internet's not good for that kind of stuff. <laughs> but gratitude shifts everything. Thank you, cancer, for all you have taught me. You forced my mind to grow. And I would put my earphones on, and I would go into my meditation of music that I had created to take me from my sister's song, Holy Spirit, which talks about being my guide and getting out of the way. Holy Spirit, be my guide. Through release, through forgiveness, through gratitude, through joy, through acceptance, the last song was healing has happened. A declaration. So for that hour, I would be seeped in the music and taken on a journey with this drip coming through me, but taken on a journey of love and peace and positive energy and working lovingly with my body to accept the medicine as it was meant to be medicine. And I remembered that, of course, the good cells were sacrificing their lives for the bad cells to die, right? But I remembered immediately what unity taught me the word sacrifice means. Sacrifice means to be made sacred. So the good cells that were sacrificing their lives for my highest good were being made sacred for my highest good and that shifted everything. Oh, holy shift. The first two times through Chemo Dreamo, I was in Indianapolis and my mom or dad were with me almost every time. Sometimes my husband came, which was delicious. I would talk to them or we would read or sing together while the pre-meds were going through. Then when the bag came, whoever was with me would pray over the bag, upbeat. Um, nothing can shake this immovable peace. Songs that we could sing, enjoy together while the pre-meds were coming through. Then we all blessed the bag and sang my sister's Holy Spirit to the bag itself. Then we would keep singing another hour's worth of more meditational music while I rested with the drip. I call them my chemo sabi. I had no idea how it was going to affect them. It was a completely selfish request, completely selfish. And I have learned since how my Kimosabi's lives have been changed because of this practice. Uh, 
one dear friend told me that she would be happy to come be my chemo sabi because she knew darn well she was busy on Mondays. <laughs> one time when it was shifted to Tuesday, she said, oh crap, now I have to go. Oh my God, this must be something for me. And she was in such terror. I had no idea. She had no idea what to expect. She thought I was going to be sick. You know what people envision when you're doing chemo? There's all kinds of misconceptions. Well, some not so misconceptions. When she came, she cried all the way through it, and she sang with us. And she put her arms around me, and she said, oh my God, you took away my fear. How in the world did you do that? In these three hours here, I have no more fear of chemo, even if I had to do it myself. And all we did was sing. She was just beside herself, and her whole demeanor changed. And I have to believe that it shifts things from the inside out, dealing with music and song through love every single time, every single time. And what the nurses and doctors got out of it. They would come to me the week after I was singing this song when I was making coffee and I realized it was one of yours. <laughs> How cool is that? So they look forward to me coming in because the chemo sabi uplifts them too. And even having to work around all the people in the room, they're so accommodating because they know how it helps me. And a year ago, when I was in chemo, chemo Dreamo, one of my chemo sabi members asked me, well, what happens if this doesn't work and you die anyway? And I said, this isn't about healing in the future. It's about having fun now. So when I do die in the future, I'm never going to have to look back and say, gee, I wish I had fun during chemo. <laughs> or I wish I was able to have more fun. Because having fun, especially during chemo, oh my god, that's three hours of my life every week. Why not have fun? And how best to have fun than with music and singing and dancing when I could get up. We did a lot of that. Love solutions making my whole body whole. Love solutions making my whole body whole. Love solutions bathing my body in gold. I never call it my cancer. It's my cancer dance, but it's not my cancer. But the idea of reframing how cancer looks and feels reframing how a colostomy looks and feels. So learning how to not deal with, but love, appreciate a colostomy bag that was so disgusting was another layer of education, to say the least. Because how could I not appreciate something now that was literally saving my life? So I went on Facebook and I asked my friend, do you want to see Lucy? Do you want me to publicize it? Well, one friend wrote back and said, well, you know, I don't think I'd really like to see your asshole. Another friend wrote back and said, my uh, brother had a colostomy, so when I know you're posting it, I'll just look somewhere else. Well, so I did. I posted her with just the stoma, which looks like a little butthole, then with a little apparatus, then with a bag. Well, the first guy that commented said, huh, that's pretty interesting. Maybe I would want to see your asshole after all. <laughs> Just crazy. I mean, after the first surgery, I was 89 pounds. I was emaciated. I looked like what I imagined an Auschwitz patient looked like back then. I got released from the hospital after the first hysterectomy, which was successful. Went home, and three days later, I was in sepsis. They had nicked a bowel, or had pried off an infected ovary off of a weakened bowel. Whatever, I had sepsis all through me. I was helicoptered from Bloomington to Indianapolis. That was the biggest drama we had through the whole six years. In that space, in the helicopter, I was so close to dying that I was really reaching out to spirit. And I said, okay, God, if it's my time, I guess I'm ready. But my mother is not 
you take care of my mommy. Well, when I came out of it, obviously I hadn't died, but I had to confess to someone that I, I had given up. And it was my father who had my hand held. And I said, Daddy, I can't be brave anymore. And he said, Honey, let us be brave for you. And that was the first realization I recognized that I don't have to do it by myself. Even with spirit, I can rely on my family and my community. I don't have to be brave. What does it feel like not to be brave? It was so interesting. But I woke up with a bag. I woke up with a colostomy. I said, OK, God, what do I do with this? And I heard again, have fun with it. Right. How in the heck do you have fun with a colostomy? Well, I named her Lucy. I had to make her a friend. It was painful. I had another emergency surgery when she started to heal herself. <clears throat> it, the appliance never fit. But in order to live with it, thank God only for nine months. It was the longest nine months of my life. Other people aren't so lucky. They're living with this for the rest of their lives. <sighs> but in order to live with that, I had to make a friend with it. So using song, using all the tools I could to embrace the pain, uh, work through it, learn how to give myself shots in my spare skin of my, what was left of my tummy to keep my blood from clotting. How do I give myself a shot every morning in my tummy? Singing and smiling, smiling and singing, singing and smiling. 15 minutes a day. My husband knew exactly what I was doing when. It was crazy, but that's the only way I could do it. But demystifying the colostomy was an amazing, uh, it was necessary for me, so it wasn't as brave as people might think, but it was amazing to see the responses because there's so much fear around having to wear a bag. My father confessed to my husband that one of his biggest fears was having to wear a bag at the end of his life, but seeing how matter-of-factly I dealt with Lucy took away his fear. I had no idea. So if that worked for my father, imagine how many other people were affected, and now it's in the book. So to demystify all the stuff that people just don't know is a part of cancer or are afraid of, takes down those blockages and I think makes things a little bit easier. When I was teaching people how to sing full time, writing songs, I came across the book Messages from Water by Masuru Emoto that was proof positive about how effective, powerful, and meaningful our words are. And I really started watching my language, how I talked to my body, how I felt about myself, and recognized, first of all, how insidious my negative self-talk was. So that was the first thing I got to shift. I had to shift. But then embracing the cancer dance, I recognized how eager I was to share a different way of telling people or having other people talk about me. I had to reframe that for them. I called my mom right off when I was first diagnosed and the words I used were, Mom, I get to heal from ovarian cancer. Oh, little darling, she said. But using those words, I said, Mom, when you talk to people, and I know you will, please use those same words. Lauren gets to heal from ovarian cancer. And when I went on Facebook, I said the same thing. Do not say, Lauren has, Lauren's suffering from, Lauren's battling, Lauren's fighting. I don't do any of that stuff. Lauren gets to heal from ovarian cancer. That reframing sounds like semantics, but it changes everything. It lifts everything up into an opportunity instead of a, oh my God, I've got cancer, you know? It feels different. Consequently, it feels different when people talk about it to them. And it changes the cellular structure of the water in our bodies, if not everything else. So to have that buzz, Lauren gets to heal, is so different than, 
Oh, poor Lauren. So that was the first aha I had about how absolutely necessary it was to educate people how to talk about this. So language is very important. I uh, bring people with me to chemo dreamo. I change that word. I change the word the way cancer is spelled. If you imagine the word C-A-N-C-E-R has so much negative connotation, even looking at it on the page. We want to call it the big C. We don't even want to say the word. Think about what rhymes with cancer. The word answer. Big capital A with a little bitty C. My sister calls it answer. It's got a little hiccup to it. I mean, how desperate can I be when I have answer, right? Other people say, see the word C answer. It changes everything. So Lucy was the first chance I got to really practice with that. But then I got to apply it to chemo dreamo. How in the world do I go through chemo dreamo, chemo? It wasn't dreamo yet. How do I go through chemotherapy knowing that the bag was marked po uh, poison, knowing that at least 80% of the stuff on the internet is negative about chemo? It's only to line the pockets of the doctors and there's so many other things out there but chemo. But as dire as my cancer was at the time, I really had no choice. So I had to make peace with that too. And I had to tell people to quit sending me negative stuff about chemo. I was going to change it. And I was going to change it from the inside out. Not just accepting it as it was, but to change it. So chemo became chemo dreamo. Both capital letters with a slash in between. Again, it changed the way it felt. Do it differently. No fear, have fun. How do I have fun with cancer? You'll learn. Well, the first thing I was directed to do was to change the spelling, which we talked about, and then to go public. I was on Facebook. I only had about 2,000 or so friends and I started asking for prayer support and reminding people how to share the news that Lauren gets to heal from ovarian cancer. I had so much response from people just because I was sharing from the very, very beginning. I get to heal, holy shift, how am I gonna do this? And that's one of my favorite catchphrases is holy shift. It feels like I'm swearing, but with that F in there, it gives me permission to really use that expletive. And it, you know, it makes people laugh. So the first Facebook post I posted was, holy shift, I get to heal from ovarian cancer. Prayers, please.